Amen. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Hank. I appreciate you uh, introducing me. And yes, I he actually took the first part of what I was going to talk about because, yeah, we go back a long, long time back to the dance studio. And uh, if you guys want any embarrassing stories regarding your worship leader, Mr. Matthew Womble, I've got a good one that involves summer camp road trip, my 1999 Chevy Blazer. And he's already, you know, looking at me. <laughs> And a six-week-old Taco Bell taco, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> I'll let you think about that for a second. <laughs> Anyways, I was brought in today to talk to you guys about one of uh, uh, the topics that I am passionate about, and that is Christmas, the origins of Christmas, and pretty much just Christmas traditions that have led to how we celebrate Christmas today. So I tell you that I love Christmas. Personally, I, I truly, truly mean it. I love everything about it. I love the Christmas lights, the trees, the decorations, the hot chocolate, all that stuff that goes with it. In fact, I love Christmas so much, I'm going to show you a picture of the socks that I'm wearing right now. <laughs> if you can't see it, it says, I can't feel my face when I'm with you. And it's a gingerbread man with part of his <laughs> face eaten. And just to let you know, if y'all don't remember, I, uh, I just thrive off of the cheesy jokes and puns and things, so uh, get used to it. <clears throat> So when I tell you that, you know, absolutely love Christmas, uh, I'm working actually on trying to get like a PhD in it. And some people laugh at that point, but I'm, I'm for real. Um, collecting books of Christmas histories from all over the world and uh, just trying to compile everything together to see how I can make this an academic thing. So uh, when I tell you that I do this, it's a lot there. OK, uh, even love all of the Christmas movies. We've got all the classics, right? Cl Christmas Story, Christmas Vacation. Elf, who loves Elf? <laughs> who thinks Elf's annoying? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, even some of the other classics like Die Hard, right? <laughs> and it, it feels like every year Hallmark keeps producing more and more movies, right? We've got like a hundred different Hallmark movies coming out every Christmas season. And uh, let me tell you right now, I, I'm, I'm not the biggest lover of those, but my wife does. So if she loves them, guess who loves them? That's right. And, and just to let you guys know, if you're not watching these movies with your significant other, it is a completely different love language. Okay, you, you, need, to, you need to get on that. But before we jump into these origin stories, so that was a little bit about myself and everything. Before we jump into these origin stories, we're going to start with Scripture. And I know you guys love the Scriptures. You guys are in it every, every week. So we're going to start in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, the book of Ecclesiastes. What better book to talk about Christmas and joy and just peace and everything? Because if you're familiar with the book of Ecclesiastes, you know that this book is quite possibly the saddest book in the Bible. Yes. It is the bummer of all bummers. In fact, the writer of Ecclesiastes, this guy had everything. He had the power. He had money. He had wisdom. He had a little bit of everything you could think of. Any kind of pleasure that he wanted, he had it at his fingertips. He could command it and get it. And when he starts the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, of everything in life, all of that money, power, everything you can think of, it's all meaningless. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. He says it over and over again in the first couple of chapters. Some of your translation says, vanity of vanities. Meaning that it's here one second, and it's gone the next. What is the point of it all? Like I said, Merry Christmas. <laughs> and then we end up in chapter 3, and the verses are going to be up on the screen. He says, what's the point of it all? Here we go. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. If you've got a highlighter, I want you to highlight this next portion. And if you're using a digital one, then tap it and make it highlight. But he says, He, God, has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. 
that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. And I believe that verse right there, verse 11, where he says that God has put eternity in the hearts of man. That is what's going to unlock all of these Christmas origin stories. And even more than that, I believe that that is all origin stories. All of this, the explanations of creation and the, the gods that people came up with and the different deities that people have worshipped throughout all of time. It is because we have this eternity in our hearts. Become, from the beginning, God has set eternity in our hearts. So we look for ways to explain it. People look for things outside of just our own lives. So we start to worship things in our own image. We start to worship the stars and worship all of these things. And you have a history of people worshiping things other than the Creator. It's because it's inside of us. And he says there's a response to that eternity. We have responses to those. And he says in verses 12 through 13 that he knows there's nothing better than for people to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and enjoy their work, that that is the gift of God. Okay, so let's take that passage and let's bring it back to Christmas. Because for the majority of history, Christmas has not been celebrated the way that we know it today. In fact, up until 200 years ago, Christmas looked radically different. It didn't even really start to have glimpses of how we celebrate Christmas until about 100 years ago. There was even a time, believe it or not, that here in the United States, Christmas was banned. It was before we were known as the United States. We had the original colonies. The Puritans banned Christmas. So... For a majority of time that Christmas has been celebrated, it looked like the response to eternity to eat, to drink, and enjoy the work that has been done. So that brings us to the very first tradition that we're going to talk about, and that is a, a, an ancient Roman festival called Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a big celebration named after the god of Saturn. Now, some of your friends and people that you know on Facebook may post memes online and talk about that Christmas, this Christian holiday, is just repackaged on top of a pagan holiday. And that more than likely, they're talking about this festival right here called Saturnalia. So I want to give you a little bit of insight to it so that you understand and we understand that there are some traditions that have come from pagan festivals that we have drawn from that end up being in the thing that we know as Christmas. So Saturnalia, this was a time of letting loose and going nuts, okay? This was a time where there would be lots of eating and drinking, huge feasts. And during that time, you'd have a lot of different ways to celebrate. So if you put eating and drinking and drinking and drinking, uh, eventually people start to get a little, you know, fluid. Well, one of the things that happens is people start singing, Right? And this was some of the first times recorded where people would go up to people's doors, knock, and say, we've got songs for you, and they'd sing them songs. This is a precursor to Christmas caroling that we know that as. And one of the other things that happened a lot is that people would give gifts to each other. But most notably, they would give gifts to children and to people who had less than themselves the less fortunate. Because during Saturnalia, the social order was completely taken and put upside down. It was a time where chaos would reign. And when I say upside down, meaning that the poor could show up to people's houses, knock and say, give me your food, and it would happen. They would comply. For these couple of weeks, anything and everything could happen. And what I find most interesting is that it happens during the time of year where things slow down. If you think about it, you enter into the darkest, coldest part of the year. This takes place during what's called the winter solstice. 
You'll hear a lot of people say happy solstice or, you know, things like that. They're talking about entering into the darkest, coldest part of the year where all of the work is done. Nobody's harvesting. There's animals that have to be slaughtered because they're not going to make it through the winter time. So you have an abundance of food, you have an abundance of people with time on their hands, and basically capping off the year saying, everything's done. Let's celebrate. Let's party. Because when things start to get cold and dark, there's something inside of us that says, I got to let it out. Something has to happen. And that is what brings us with more of this with Saturnalia. And this goes on for hundreds of years, okay? Hundreds and hundreds of years, up until the 300s, when Christianity becomes the state religion of Rome. So when this happens, there's now this newly established church, the Roman church, which you guys probably know today as the Catholic church, right? This church gets established, and they have tons of festivals that all of their people have been celebrating for years. You have Saturnalia, which is just one of them. They inherited this gigantic calendar, so what are they supposed to do? Well, what they do is they start to take these festivals and the things, the pace of life that people have already set, and they start to put Jesus on top of it. In fact, even Nicholas, the one of Santa Claus fame, he gets wrapped up into it unwillingly, but we're going to talk about him in a little bit. Which actually kind of reminds me, if you have families in here and anyone who hasn't had a discussion with their families about um, Santa Claus and anything beyond having a naughty or nice list, just want to give you a heads up now because the third origin story that we're going to talk about is actually the origins of Santa Claus. It'll be a full explanation. So we'll, we'll give you opportunity to know about that. If you want to step outside and come back in, just want to be sensitive uh, to those things because we're going to be talking about them. Okay, so the second origin story that leads to the traditions we have today is uh, about bringing evergreens into the house. When I say evergreens, you may be thinking, okay, what, what are you talking about? Christmas trees, right? So how many of you guys have a Christmas tree? All right, how many of you have a real Christmas tree? Oh, wow, only a couple. So I'm assuming everyone else has a fake one? Yes. Rock on, I'm right there with you, yeah. Okay, it was opposite the last time I did this. Okay, so, so we'll have a chance to judge you guys now. <laughs> because the last time I did this, I said, well, who has a real tree? And then everyone was like, oh, you got a fake tree. And I was like, hey, it got a little, all right. But uh, so just a couple numbers for you. At, at any given moment in the United States, there are 350 million real live trees growing inside of Christmas tree farms all over. That is a ton of Christmas trees. In fact, every year, according to the people who keep track of these things, there are 25 to 30 million real live Christmas trees sold. That, that just blows my mind because that doesn't even take into account all of us who are getting our trees somewhere else, right? The fake trees. So it wasn't until about the 1500s, the early 1500s, that we have the first recorded incident, that's the incident, the first recorded time that somebody brought a tree into their home um, at, for what we know is like a Christmas tree. But putting evergreens into the house is a practice that goes back for hundreds of years, probably just as far back as the practice of Saturnalia, uh, just in a different part of the world. So you have the, uh, the Celtics and the Druids, who are also other pagans, who would bring evergreens into their house during the solstice as a symbol of hope and life. Put yourself back in that situation, right? Go back hundreds of years. You're about to enter into this time where you can't go outside necessarily for long periods of time. We don't have indoor heating. You don't have uh, any kind of extra refrigeration for your stuff. So you're basically living on bare bone minimums and you're cooped up inside for a really long period of time. Things get dark. Things get lonely. Even if you have a family, you start looking at them kind of funny, right? <laughs> so you need some Something, they needed something to, to put their focus on that would say, there is hope coming. Spring will be around the corner. So they would bring these evergreens inside of their house. And then in the 1500s, you have people bringing in these full trees. When I say full trees, we tend to think, you know, sometimes we've got these big trees, the ceiling trees. These were like four foot tall trees. 
Okay, and the uh, the practice of lighting the Christmas tree actually has a pretty cool story that uh, a legend has it in in church history. So you guys may know a, a church father known as Martin Luther. He kicked off the Reformation, hanging and banging the ninety five theses on the Catholic Church wall, and. Uh, it says, the story goes, that Martin Luther is out walking at night, spending time with the Lord, and he is just looking out at the sky, and he goes, man, look at how beautiful God's glory is. The stars are bright. The moon, it's beautiful. And he's just overwhelmed because we all have that eternity inside of our hearts, right? And that eternity just starts beating, you know, exponentially. And he's excited, and he says, man, how can I duplicate this? He goes back inside his house and he sees that tree that he brought in as that symbol of hope. So he lights a candle and he puts it on there and he says, huh, oh, that kind of looks like a twinkling star. What if I add another and I add another? And thus we have borne the practice of lighting a Christmas tree. We fast forward a, a couple of hundred years, and the practice of putting trees into homes really starts to pick up in the United States. We have a lot of German immigrants coming in, and in Germany, with these places, is where this practice was really popular. And in 1931, the workers who were putting up this new skyscraper called the Rockefeller Center in New York, they celebrate by bringing in a 20-foot tree in front of the building. Have any of you guys gone and seen the Rockefeller Center tree? That's awesome. Yeah, it's on my bucket list. I want to go. Um, started at 20 foot, and then every year the tree kept getting bigger and bigger until finally in 2016 they top out with a 94 foot tall tree. That is a real tree. They pick that tree out a year in advance to make sure that everything's lined up and that it goes well. So every year, most of us in here, we get a Christmas tree and we put lights on it and we put ornaments on it. And it's this symbol of hope. It's this symbol of life in the middle of a dark and cold time. It's that symbol of eternity that's inside of our hearts that beats all of the time. So we're going to talk about our third origin story. If anybody wants to, to exit, because we're talking about the jolly old man himself, Santa Claus. All right, we're all good. Okay, <laughs> so I want to make sure, because I'm about to tell you, Santa Claus is real. <laughs> the person that he's based on is real. And that person was actually a, a, a bishop in Turkey. His name was Nicholas. He would go on to become a saint, and he has influenced church history for a very long time. He was born in the late 200s, and he was a, a bishop into the 300s. Now, Nicholas was born into a wealthy family. He, like every Christmas story, there's tragedy. He had a wealthy family. His parents pass away at a young age, and he takes that inheritance, so he receives this giant inheritance, and he starts to do good with it taking care of people. In fact, Nicholas is known as the protector saint in the Catholic Church. He is the protector of um, uh, sailors and children and people who are in the marketplace. And part of why he became known to be that type of saint as a protector is because this guy would step in when he saw injustice being done. He would insert himself into situations when people were having harm done to them. This guy would be defense. He was kind of like a, a Captain America type figure way before there was Captain America. And in fact, there was one article that I was reading about him that said they were trying to reconstruct his face with CGI and x-rays and, and all this kind of stuff. And they said that uh, what they found out is that his nose was probably completely like smashed in on the side. More than likely, because he inserted himself into a situation where he got his he got kicked, <laughs> okay? Um, or because this was one of the guys before Christianity became the state religion, he was persecuted for being this bishop. Now, one of the other notable things about Nicholas, and it, I, like I said, he has a, a, a long, long history, is that this guy was at the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea was there to uh, combat heresy. And one of the 
to goes is that he got so worked up over this heresy that was being told that he hit the guy exclaiming heresy. Yeah. Did you know that about Santa? <laughs> right? If you made the naughty list or, you know, you weren't there, he'd knock you out. So he lays the smack down on heresy, but we have all of these stories, but one of the most famous stories that we have about Nicholas is the story of a family that was in his village. And there was this poor father, and this poor father had three daughters. And those daughters didn't have, obviously didn't have money because their father was poor. And during this time, if you didn't have money to give to your daughters, they, they couldn't get married. They didn't have a dowry. So your, your option, or the option that the dad was going to take with these three daughters was going to be to sell them off. Think about what that means. They were about to enter into the world of sex trafficking. Nicholas gets wind of this. He says, no, I, I can't have this happen. So, by cover of night, in secrecy, he goes to the family's home and he tosses in a bag of gold coins through the window. They wake up, boom, dowry for the first daughter taken care of. He does this two more times to pay off the dowries for all three daughters. And on the third night, the dad kind of on to figuring out, okay, the gold coins aren't just showing up in my house. <laughs> he catches them. And he says, hey, what are you doing? And, and, and Nicholas is like, hey, I, I'm, I'm taking care of things. This is, this is a gift. Take it. And he says, no, I, I got to tell people. I got to tell people. And Nicholas says, shh, this is for the glory of God. Don't tell anyone. And he swears him to secrecy. Well, we're repeating the story today. I think it got out. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> And all of this stuff, these, these stories of his generosity, it starts to, to go to different countries. And it gets exponentially bigger and bigger. And his, his love of justice and, and, and all of those things, people start to talk about it in places like Norway and Denmark and Sweden and Finland. These are Nordic countries. And what about the Nordic countries and their expressions of eternity were to have gods like Thor and Thor's father, Odin. Odin was this big, big guy who has a long, flowy beard who would take his horse and fly around his village at night to make sure that justice and peace were happening in their village. Well, you can kind of see what's happening here. We have these stories meeting these stories, and they start getting intertwined, <clears throat> right? I mean, flying over town by night, maybe not by horse, but by reindeer. But, like I said, there's a ton, a ton of information here. I had all the time to, to take us through for hours and hours. We could talk about just Nicholas himself. Um, but eventually, you know, these stories change into the Santa that we know today. In fact, when I say about 200 years ago, you, you wouldn't probably even recognize him if you started to see those pictures. He was super tall. He was skinny. He was kind of built the way that Odin was. And <clears throat> his uh, robes, they weren't bright red. They were maroon, as if they, had, they said, as if they had been dipped in blood. Those were the, the pictures that they would have of him. Well... Fast forward to the United States and capitalism, and we have joyful, wonderful Coca-Cola grabbing hold of this figure, um, and they that and stamp the red on top of him. But before that, I mean, there was a, 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 a pastor who wrote a poem the night before Christmas, right? And during the night before Christmas, they describe him as a holly jolly character, and it, it's just this total transformation. But like I said, I, I don't want to get too much into it because then we'll be here all day. Um, but, but some of the high points. What does Santa do today? He listens to children. He gives those children gifts. And he does that according to the list that he's made, whether you're naughty or nice. And he judges them. You thought about that? Santa's sitting there as judge over children. He watches them from far away. And he comes out once a year. You see, even Santa, with, with all of these fantastical stories that we've come up about him, we still have given him attributes of eternity. We have given him attributes that make him out to be a godlike figure. And I want us to keep that in mind as we explore one other origin story. Another origin story that we celebrate big time during Christmas. 
Turn with me to John chapter 1. <clears throat> We're starting in verse 1, and it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That light was named Jesus, and the darkness did not comprehend it, did not comprehend Him. They couldn't make sense of Him. Think about it. According to the Bible, Jesus shows up on earth born of a virgin, born in a manger. There's no room for Him at the end. This hope for all of mankind shows up first to shepherds, born to parents who weren't even married at the time. And I wish I could stand up here and tell you that, you know, Jesus' birthday is December 25th, and it's more than likely not. I wish I could tell you that his birth looks like the pretty manger scene that we see and we prop up, and it, it probably didn't look that clean. See, Jesus shows up, and the people around him can't understand or comprehend him. And as he starts his earthly ministry, he starts to say things and teach things that are radical and crazy. He would tell people things like, in order to save your life, you need to lose your life. In order to truly love, don't just love those who love you back, but love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. You want to get more out of life? Then give more of your life away. It's opposite of how we think we're supposed to get more out of this life. So when people say that Jesus is the reason for the season, I kind of cringe a little bit. And don't kick me out, Meadowcrest, for what I'm about to say. But I don't think he's the reason for the season. I think the reason for the season is that we have that eternity in our hearts and we're always looking for ways to fill that eternity. So what happens is that it manifests itself trying to fill that eternity with festivals like Saturnalia, celebrating gods that we have created in our own image. It, it, it manifests itself in bringing everything into our homes in the form of Christmas trees so that we can have hope and life. For most of history, you have people looking and saying, I need something, I need that hope, I need that life during the coldest, darkest points of the year. It manifests itself in us creating this person who travels all around the world and drops off good gifts to children. It manifests itself in trying to explain away the eternity that's in our hearts. And I think that's why we have the season right now that we have is Christmas. Because it's built into us to explore something beyond ourselves in eternity. And the answer to that eternity shows up on earth in a manger. He grows up to ultimately be the sacrifice for our sins so that we can be back in relationship with Father God. The person that is actually bigger than all of the things we just mentioned, those three Christmas origin stories, the person who can actually fulfill all of that stuff is in Jesus. Amen. So that's why I find it awesome that we celebrate the birth of Jesus at this time. That even though it took over a pagan holiday, it was in the darkest, coldest times of the year. So that for us right now, for you guys right here, right now, Christmas is not always a joyful, happy time. In fact, even in this moment, you may have a lot of darkness and loneliness and things happening around you that makes you look and say, what's the point? Do I need another holiday in my life? What's the point? 
And you think about the songs we sing. We sang O Holy Night, and it says in there, A weary world rejoices. Back up. A weary world. A world that is tired, that is beat down. The thrill of hope in the middle of the night. And we have other songs that say, Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice in the middle of those lonely, cold nights. When we think that all hope is lost, when we're upset and we're looking at other people enjoying things and saying, I don't have that in my life, bam, born of a virgin is the hope, is the one telling us that you have a chance at life. And it's a free, free gift. Ephesians chapter 2 Verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. That what Solomon couldn't fulfill with power, with wealth, with wisdom, with pleasure... What Solomon couldn't fulfill with all of those things. Guys, with what we can't fulfill with all of those things. The answer isn't more money. The answer isn't having a bigger family. The answer isn't if I just had a little bit more. What you're feeling at that moment is that eternity in your heart crying out. That's That's not the answer. The answer is in that free gift in the life of Jesus. That's what Scripture says being saved is. And guess what? You can't earn it. You can't earn it. It's there for you. It is a free gift of salvation. So, that. I love Jesus. Isn't it awesome? (laughs) This is uh, an ornament box. It is in the form of a gift, right? Gift box. And we have some out on that tree over there. And that is going to be uh, something for you guys to pick up to have a reminder of the free gift that Jesus has for us. So I I, want to end with this is to tell you guys again, I just want to reiterate. There was somebody who had more than all of us, that writer of Ecclesiastes. He tried to fulfill his life with money, power, wisdom, wealth, all of those things. And it didn't work. But we have this opportunity here to receive a free gift in the life of Jesus to fill that eternal void in our hearts. And that's right there. That is why I love Christmas. Because it is in these moments that we get to feel feel that and get filled up. That's that thrill of hope that we get to talk about. So, Merry Christmas, everyone. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the gift that you have given us in the life and birth of Jesus. Jesus, thank you for being obedient to the will of the Father. You didn't have to listen necessarily. You, You chose to show up here on earth to be that light and life. I mean, just the... The awesomeness of it. Just thank you. I want you to know that if there's anybody here today, you're hearing this for the first time, and you're saying, man, Chris, I, I thought we were just going to talk about these Christmas traditions, and you know, I knew there was the birth of Jesus in here, but I, I want you to know that, yes, Christmas is more than just the presents. It's more than the chaos. It's more than the family time. It's more than all of these things. It is the answer to that thing inside of your heart that says, I can never be satisfied. I never seem to have enough. Why me? Guys, you are in the same boat. We are in the same boat that people have been in for all mankind. We wake up, we go to work, and we try to fill that void in our heart. And Jesus is there on the other side saying, I showed up I know you can't comprehend me as you're sitting in darkness. And my prayer right now is that the Holy Spirit would waken that up inside of you and that you would respond to that to receive the free gift of salvation. And you say, God, 
I may not understand all this stuff, but I do know that I need Jesus in my life. Jesus, I'm yours. We want to celebrate, celebrate that new life as we carry this in to the Christmas season, that during all of the chaos, that we would take time out to say, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. And we celebrate. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.